kicking off the list at number 10, Lost Treasure. All right, listen up, you buccaneers. There have been so many shipwrecks all throughout history that right now, at this moment, there's about $60 billion worth of sunken treasure just waiting, just out there waiting for you, for you to put on your goggles and explore. Deep sea exploration teams have found a few recently. That's exciting. Back in 2012, we discovered the Port Nicholson, which was a World War II British merchant ship that sunk with 70 tons of platinum ingots. So many ingots. Ingots? Gots? Ingots. All the ingots or gits. That's over $3 billion worth of treasure. Not too shabby. Shortly after that, shipwreck hunters found the remains of HMS Victory, ironic name, which sank back in 1744 with a billion dollars worth of gold. It's not just finders keepers though. You know, as lovely as that sounds, this is not national treasure. Treasure belongs to people before and after the commute. When an American company recovered $500 million in gold and silver from a ship in Spain that went down back in 1804, they lost the rights to their treasure. They lost the rights to the treasure they found. That is so, can you imagine that? Guys, we're rich. Just kidding. The Senora de la Mercedes was a Spanish ship that sunk back in 1804. It was loaded with gold, silver, and spices, all the good stuff. It was found at the bottom of the Atlantic back in 2007, and these finders thought that they had 500 million. We're rich, and we can maybe, maybe pay off our student loans with this Money. Who knows? They were rich until the Spanish government sued the exploration team in 2012, taking all that treasure right back. All of this treasure. Yeah, not theirs anymore. In our number nine spot today, we have the Toya Maru. This ship was a Japanese train ferry that was out to sea in between the islands of Hokkaido and Honshu in 1954 when it was struck by Typhoon Marie. The captain tried to ride it out and attempted to anchor the ship in place, but the winds were so strong that it broke free. Seawater began pouring into the engine compartment, which then caused the steam engine to quit running, and the ferry was then completely uncontrollable. The captain continued to try whatever he could to get the the ship to safety and he even tried to beach the ship but unfortunately the waves were just too powerful. After being tossed around in the waves and battered by the water and after all the rain and strong winds the ship ended up capsizing and sinking. In the end 1,163 people lost their lives in this disaster including 35 American soldiers who are members of the US Army's 1st Cavalry Division Artillery. The Toya Maru wasn't the only ship sunk in this storm as Typhoon Marie also sank four other ferries as well. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Taiping Steamer. In 1949, the Taiping Steamer was out to sea and was seriously overloaded with 1,000 war refugees on board. This ship was sailing from Shanghai, China to Keelung, Taiwan when it collided with a cargo vessel called the Qianyuang. At the time of this accident, the Taiping was fleeing the Chinese Civil War, which is why it was so overcrowded, when it only should have been holding a maximum of 580 passengers. This kind of overcrowding did not help with the sinking of the ship and sadly only sped up the process. It is also said that the ship was steaming without lights even though it was after curfew, which of course likely didn't help to avoid this very tragic situation. Sadly, there were 1,500 people who lost their lives in this collision. In our number 7 spot today, we have the SS Principe Umberto. This ship was built in 1909 as an Italian passenger ship, but in the times during the First World War, it ended up being converted into an armed merchant cruiser. On June 8, 1916, this ship was transporting troops on the Adriatic Sea. These troops were part of the 55th Infantry Regiment and were on their way back from Albania to Italy. Although the ship was accompanied by others, it still ended up being struck by an Austro-Hungarian U-5 submarine that had launched a torpedo attack. This ship ended up sinking just minutes later and it is said that this disaster took the lives of 1,926 men, making it the worst naval disaster of the First World War in terms of lives lost. In our number 6 spot today, we have the Yamato. This ship was a Japanese Japanese battleship that served in the Second World War. She was the lead ship of her class of battleships and she was one of the two of the heaviest and most powerfully armed battleships ever constructed. On April 7th, 1945, the ship was about 300 kilometers south of the Japanese island of Kyushu when it was confronted by a US carrier-based aircraft. This aircraft bombed the ship which led to it capsizing. This then caused the ammunition on board to explode which tore the ship in two. After a total of 13 torpedo hits and eight hits the ship completely sunk. The ship was accompanied by a light cruiser and four other destroyers which were all sunk in this event as well. This sadly led to thousands of deaths as most of the crew lost their lives in this battle. In our number 5 spot today we have the Joseph Stalin. The Joseph Stalin was of course a Soviet passenger ship that was converted to carry troops during the second world war. This ship was very important to Soviet forces as it was used in 1941 in the evacuation of Tallinn and was later used to evacuate the Soviet naval base 
base in Hango, Finland. Just after this evacuation, on December 3rd, 1941, the ship ended up entering the Gulf of Finland where it encountered three German mines. This led to the crew scrambling around to try and fix up the damage that the mines had caused. While they were distracted by this, Finnish forces ended up spotting the ship and saw an opportunity to strike. This led to the ammunition that was on board the Soviet ship to detonate, which ended up taking the lives of 3,849 out of the 5,589 who were on board. Those who didn't lose their lives in this incident ended up being captured and held as prisoners of war by the German forces. In our number four spot today, we have the SS Cap Arcona. This ship was a German luxury ocean liner that was launched in 1927. But by the time the mid 1940s rolled around, however, like many other ships on this list, this one was put to use to help in the country's war efforts. This time, this ship was converted into a prison ship. In April of 1945, with the advance of the British Army, prisoners being held at concentration camps were being loaded onto ships, and the Cap Arcona was one of them. On May 3rd, 1945, with more than 6,000 people on board, the ship was attacked by the British Air Force. The prisoners on board were being held below deck at the time, and the ship was not marked with any sort of red cross, so unfortunately, those in the British Air Force did not realize that the ship was filled with prisoners at the time. The ship capsized, but did not sink entirely, but still, this wreck caused somewhere around 5,000 deaths. In our number three spot today, we have the HMS Armenia. This was a Soviet passenger ship that was first launched in November of 1928, and she had a maximum capacity of 980 passengers. During the Second World War, this ship was put to use by transporting troops, and from October 9th, 1941, the ship was used to evacuate soldiers, workers, and materials from Odessa. In November of 1941, there was the invasion of German troops that led to an extreme rush to evacuate the hospitals in the city of Sevastopol, and the Armenia was repurposed again into a hospital ship. This led to about 4,000 wounded people and medical personnel from 11 different hospitals being loaded onto the ship to set sail towards Yalta. Once there, another 1,000 passengers were loaded onto the ship in a rush, none of which were officially recorded. On November 7th, the ship was attacked by a German Heinkel HE-111 and in just four minutes, the ship sadly sank, taking the lives of almost everyone on board. Just eight people survived the entire ordeal. In German records, there is no mention that the Armenia was a hospital ship, so it's unclear if they omitted that tale or if they mistakenly believed that it was a troop carrier. Either way, it is absolutely devastating. In our number two spot today, we have the Arctic. This ship made its maiden transatlantic voyage in 1850, and it was best known for its speed. This ship was able to cross the Atlantic in just nine days. On on September 27th, 1854, the ship was sailing from Liverpool to New York City when it collided with a French steamship called the Vesta. This occurred in the thick fog that was found just off of Cape Race, Newfoundland. At first, it appeared as though the Vesta had received more damage in the collision, but soon the captain of the Arctic realized that the ship was rapidly taking on seawater. He decided to abandon the Vesta and head for land in order to save his passengers, but once he left the other ship, the damaged Arctic continued to take on water, which then put out the first furnaces and caused engines to stop working. This is when the captain ordered that those who were the most vulnerable be placed into the lifeboats first, but instead a number of crew and male passengers dashed towards the lifeboats, leaving hundreds of people to go down with the ship. There were about 400 people on board the ship that day and only 87 of them survived. 22 of the survivors were passengers and the rest crew. The captain went down with the ship, but he managed to stay alive by clinging to some wreckage until rescue came. The other ship, the Vesta, did not sink and ended up making it to St. John's, Newfoundland. The crew members who abandoned everyone else on the ship were criticized for their behavior, which violated the laws that forbid sailors to put their own safety before that of passengers in emergencies. Despite this, however, none of the men were prosecuted for their actions. In our number one spot today, we have the RMS Lancastria. This ship was a British ocean liner, but in April of 1940, she was reconstructed to be a troop ship under the command of Captain Rudolf Sharp. He sent the ship off to help aid in the evacuation of British troops and citizens from France, and on June 14th, 1940, the ship departed from Liverpool. On June 16th, the ship anchored near the town of Saint-Nazaire, and the following day, somewhere between 4,000 and 9,000 refugees loaded on board. This included civilians, soldiers, and other military officials. While carrying all of these people, around 4 p.m. on June 17th, the German Junkers Ju-88 
the ship, which caused it to capsize and sink in an extremely fast 20 minutes. This caused over 1,400 tons of fuel to leak into the water, some parts catching fire, and while there were 2,477 survivors, no one is quite sure how many people lost their lives. This is because it was obviously a hectic rescue mission that had people rushing aboard. No one is quite sure just how many people were on board before the attack happened. It is thought that somewhere from 4,000 to 6,500 people might have have lost their lives during this, which is truly a terrifying number. All right, let's get into today's list. Starting off at our number 10 spot, we have the deepest known shipwreck. Who knows how many shipwrecks lay in our oceans, considering many of them have yet to be found. The USS Johnston was a US Navy destroyer, which sank during the Battle of Samar in 1944 after a battle with a large fleet of Japanese warships. Victor Vescovo, who is one of the few people who have made the dive into the Mariana Trench, was one of the people who first stumbled upon the remains of this sunken warship. The ship's remains were first found in 2019 and it is now known as the deepest known shipwreck as it was found 6,456 meters deep in the Philippine Sea in the Pacific Ocean. Victor, who led the expedition, said, quote, The wreck is so deep that there's very little oxygen down there, and while there is a little bit of contamination from marine life, it's remarkably well intact except for the damage it took from the furious fight, end quote. This ship is so deep it took a few dives in order for them to be able to relocate the ship, which they have now been able to do entirely. There were 327 crew members on board this ship during the battle, and sadly only 141 of them survived. The diving team was sure to be respectful about their mission and laid wreaths both before and after their dives, which is just a nice note to end off this point on. Number 9. Ram's Horn Squid This little squishy dude was discovered around 3,000 feet below the surface, and scientists cannot stop talking about the way he moves. Look at him, he looks like a really slow submarine, which is pretty amazing when you think about the uh, Schmitz Ocean ROV that's down there getting this footage. It's also a submarine, how funny is that? He's looking at him, he's looking at them, they're like, what? He's like, what? They're all just both wiggling, trying to balance each other out. His body acts like a submarine's ballast does. Fluids and gases shift around, and in return, this little guy can float up and down whilst wiggling his toes. Look at him. I never thought a squid would be cute until now. Didn't know that was a possibility. Yet here we are. Part three, most amazing. Cute squid. Number eight, Catherine Sullivan. Not really a deep sea discovery, but I mean, when talking about all these discoveries, you gotta ask, who goes down there? Who does the thing, right? When an entertainer wins an Oscar, Emmy, Tony, and Grammy, we call that an EGOT. Fun little title only a handful of artists can claim. But what about somebody who's been to both space and the deepest part of our Earth? What do we call them? Well, so far, them is just one individual. Her name's Catherine Sullivan. The former NASA astronaut decided to change up directions for this trip, so she joined Victor Viscabo on one of his eight trips to the deepest known point on Earth. July 7th, 2020, Catherine Sullivan officially became the first person to do both. Go out there and down there. That's crazy. Your Fitbit's like, what are you doing? What's happening? How many steps is this? What can we call this impressive title? He got a deep got? A deep got go-getter? A deep go-getter? Yeah, you're a deep go-getter. That sounds awful. We're doing our best here. Maybe part four will have a fun name. It's impressive. It's so impressive my ears hurt thinking about all these commutes. Bravo. Hats off to you. Number seven, holy grail of shipwrecks. Okay, back to shipwrecks. It's hard to read up on these shipwrecks sometimes, well all the time, because on one hand it's fascinating to discover parts of our history we thought was once lost forever. Of course we find tons of treasure that's always fun and noteworthy, but we're also exploring the scene of a horrible wreck every single time. It's quite grim, not on paper. In 1708 the San Jose Galleon was heading to Spain from Colombia, but when the British attacked, the San Jose sank to the ocean floor and nearly all 600 crew members lost their lives. Yeah, dark history. In 2015, the ship was found with around 17 to 22 billion dollars worth of plundered valuables. See, back in the 80s, Gloca Mora Company claimed they had found the ship. Columbia was lacking the financial and technological resources to dive down and actually get it, so they agreed to give GMC 35% of the findings. In 1984, they then handed the rights over to an American company, Sea Search Armada. Then the game changed. Since then, and still to this day, legal battles have been unfolding over this lost treasure. COVID delayed it quite a bit, so if you can hold your breath for a really long time, it's still waiting there. No one knows what to do with it yet. I'm like, see ya, be right back. Number six, the Vasa shipwreck. Back in 1628, the Vasa sunk within 20 minutes of setting sail, and it claimed the lives of 30 souls on board. How tragic is that? Only 20 minutes and it was gone. The Swedish Navy launched the ship August 10th, 1628, and it was once considered a high-tech warship, even referred to as spectacular. So what happened? How did this thing sink in 20 minutes? That's crazy. Well, the first rush of wind caught it off guard, and it swayed a bit, the second rush of wind sank it. There's gotta be more. There was a crowd around and everything to send it off, but the 64 bronze cannons that were installed during
during the rushed process of building the ship were too heavy. That's why it sank. And the lack of oxygen in the water allowed for its rediscovery to continue its story. The Vasa was built with carvings all around the wood. Carvings centered around the king of the time, King Gustav II. So when the wreck was rediscovered in 1961, 95% of the wood was still intact. So it still tells the story. Number five, under the ice. This dark discovery was pretty recent. Recent as in October 2021. The Hakon Project is one I would never sign up for personally, but I'm surprised it's taken this long to do something along these lines. The Hagon Project is a group of around 30 scientists. They teamed up to send a deep sea robot 13,000 feet below the icy surface of the Arctic Ocean. This was the first time we got to see the hidden volcanic vents that have been hiding for centuries. Because obviously it's that deep and that cold and now we have the resources and people who are brave enough to go and camp out in the Arctic to go explore. That's crazy. Number four, ancient Greek shipwreck. I remember hearing about this back in 2018, so I'm excited I get to throw it on a list. The oldest shipwreck discovered in the Black Sea. It looks like it sank 50 years ago, but actually this ship is from 400 BC. It's an ancient Greek trading vessel and it's not very large, but somehow this thing is very mighty. 2,400 years later, over a mile below the surface, the lack of oxygen again actually preserved this ship. That's why it looks not ancient. John Adams, principal investigator with the Black Sea Marine Archaeology Project, describes the findings as something he never thought was even possible. Yeah, more than fair. That long ago, like we're still trying to figure out the pyramids. We're like, oh my God, this thing is just chilling there the whole time. Just a fish is staring at it. This discovery changed what we knew about seafaring in the ancient world. The oldest intact shipwreck known to mankind. That's not a bad title. Another 2,000 years, we'll find nothing but plastic on the bottom of our oceans. Number three, underwater river. We've heard about this one at some point, I'm sure, but how is this even a real thing? How is this possible? What are we looking at? What is this? Back in 2016, researchers working in the Black Sea found these very strong currents. Currents of water flowing at the bottom of the sea, like its own river, almost. If this 115 foot deep river was on land instead of, well, under the Black Sea, it would be ranked number six in the world for the amount of volume alone that's constantly rushing through it. So pretty impressive. The river carries heavy sediments along the seafloor, hence why it makes those grooves over time. And yeah, over time, those currents carve out their own path and now it's massive and extremely powerful and unstoppable. But luckily for us, you need a deep sea rover to take a good look. So you're not gonna fall in anytime soon. Number two deep waste. I mentioned some deep sea plastic on this channel before, but this 2021 discovery is just a new low, pun intended. Right off the coast of LA, hiding around 4,000 feet below the ocean's surface, sitting there for quite a long time were literal barrels of garbage, just waste. The plume of evil coming off of these things also, it looks like a nuclear wasteland. Probably because it is a literal nuclear wasteland. How horrible is that? There weren't 30 or 40 of these barrels also, in case you're wondering. There were thousands. Around 27,000 were found. Two weeks of searching with subs. What a sad expedition. That must have been. Oh my. These barrels were dropping into the ocean around 1947 to around 1961. That's the window of time. You'd think after barrel 5,000, somebody would be like, ah, this feels wrong. I don't know. And finally, number one, beneath a glacier. We had to end this part three on some new footage from the bottom of an Antarctic glacier. And this glacier also, in case you're wondering, is the size of Florida. So if you're imagining like a big ice cube, it's a bit bigger than that, just a little bit. This is like finding the bottom of a continent. This thing is massive. And we sent a rover underneath all of it. How scary is that? If it were to collapse, our sea levels would rise 10 feet, just to give you an idea of how big it is. And in 2019, researchers drilled 2,300 feet right through the Thwaites Glacier and dropped a robot with a camera down and then they just roamed around. And they saw this. Hold your breath. This is the first time we've ever seen the grounding zone of a massive glacier. There's only one meter of space between the bottom of the glacier and the rocky seafloor. Could you go down there? I don't think I could. I would swim underneath it and pretend like I'm lifting it up, you know? Just kidding. I wouldn't even get into the submarine to go down this hole. Not a chance. Also, can we not drill through a glacier the size of Florida? Just sounds like a bad idea. I don't know. Maybe that's just me. Maybe leave this project alone. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have this haunting call. Whales truly are some of the coolest animals on earth and humpback whales are no exception exception. The males of the species are known for their songs which last from 10 to 20 minutes and are actually pretty complex. They will repeat these songs for hours at a time and it honestly isn't exactly known why they sing these songs at all. All the males in the group will produce the same song and it will change seasonally. The females are also able to produce noise but for some reason it is only the males who seem to produce these long songs. It is unclear how the whales even produce these sounds however because they don't actually have vocal cords. This is all super cool and interesting, but the whole reason you're here is for the sound, so let's take a listen to a more haunting track released by the humpback whale. Okay. 
Okay, so please tell me I'm not alone in thinking that that was the most beautifully haunting sound I've ever heard come from the sea. But also imagine being alone in the ocean, not knowing what that was, and then hearing it. Probably pretty terrifying, right? At least we're all safe here in YouTube land. Number nine, giant phantom jellyfish. Beautiful, yes. Terrifying and for sure an alien, also yes. This beast was discovered back in 2021 in, you guessed it, Monterey Bay. The classic spot apparently for sea monsters. The research team sent in a deep sea robot to take a look into the abyss and they discovered this phantom giant jellyfish again. Yeah, I said again. Originally, this jellyfish was documented back in 1899, living at depths of 3,000 to 13,000 feet. It's, yeah, more than fair. She's hard to catch. Who is she down there? Never know. But luckily, we got a video of her in action last year. Check it out. This is why I don't ever go in the oceans, ever. Cheers. Number eight. Deep sea anglerfish. These guys are so scary, we have to talk about them. Living at depths of over 6,000 feet, the deep sea anglerfish lives in complete darkness. Like Vin Diesel in pitch black. It was first discovered back in 1833 when it washed ashore in Greenland and was then taken to Johann Christopher Hangman Reinhardt in Denmark. It was first referred to as the football fish or the man gobbler. Great names, okay. Female anglerfish have a glowing lure at the top of their head. That's how we recognize them. It's like the whoop thing, right, in Finding Nemo. It's scary and it's something I'm glad hides at the bottom of our oceans, but it's needed for their survival. The light is created due to bioluminescent bacteria. Thousands of fish have it, and in the deep sea, anglerfish uses it to hunt. It draws fish in right in front of its massive, scary mouth, and then just, oh. They see the disco light, and then moments later, they see another light, the light of the fish lords. The spiny dorsal fin hangs over their head. It's called an esca, it's an organ, and it emits photophore light. It's made method of hunting, which is pretty badass. It kind of has to be because it has no arms or anything. It's just a big scary face moving around the ocean. And as for prey, well, she'll take what she can get, no matter how big. Probably ate it head first, because this thing probably came in to look at the light that the anglerfish has, and then the anglerfish grabbed it and then sort of swallowed it in its stomach has expanded to sort of fit it all in. The deep sea anglerfish can expand their jaw and stomach and they can eat prey that's twice the size of them. Although they often eat shrimps, snails, and other smaller fish. But once you're in, you're tucked, you're not going anywhere. You're screwed. The males actually aren't equipped with the natural lure of light. And when they reach adulthood, their digestive system no longer functions. So it needs one of these leading ladies to survive. I'll let that speak for itself. Number seven, old coral reefs or dying coral reefs, this one's actually kind of sad. After all, the list is dark discoveries. These are all scary or dark, literal darkness for some of them. Back in 2009, after a four week expedition to explore the deep ocean, just southwest of Tasmania, scientists found deep water coral reefs, which is exciting at first until they realize that these coral reefs are dying. They're on their way out. So now there needs to be more research done into why exactly these reefs are dying. We would like to know that. That's kind of something we're working on currently. If the reason they're dying happens to extend to the shallow reefs as well, this could cause massive problems for both marine life and us, our human life. Scientists need to figure out whether the coral was dying because of the ocean warming up. Maybe it was disease or perhaps it was an increase in ocean acidity. Whatever the case is, if it extends into shallower water, it's bad news for us. 25% of marine life would lose their habitat. The coastal fishing industry would be affected, of course, so no more fish and chip specials. Save the ocean, you know? For red lobster's sake, let's smarten up and save the ocean. Number six, Chuck Lagoon. This lagoon was Japan's main base during the war, but come 1944, the United States launched an attack, which some deem as Japan's Pearl Harbor, where 60 ships were sunk and around 250 planes as well. So for 70 years, there's been a massive graveyard, literally just sitting in the depths of the Pacific. And it wasn't until recently where we got a good look at these haunting artifacts from history. This photographer went down, took some photos and said it was one of the scariest shoots ever. They described the atmosphere filled of course with you know human skulls, remains, gas masks, bullets. Obviously it was haunting to look at. Nobody wanted to go down, so that's when we send in a submarine. That's when we send in a drone because we don't like to look at skulls and picking up stuff out of the sand. We don't like to do that. Nobody was expecting these artifacts to be that well preserved after all this time too. Like all these things, even a mammoth tusk, these are all in pristine condition almost. It's like the ocean's haunting and unexplored. Hmm. Number five, holes. If you have trypophobia, you may wanna skip this one or face your fears together. I don't like holes either. I'm diving in, let's do it. Off the coast of Big Sur, California, which is a real place and not just a Mac update, a survey revealed about 15,000 holes on the bottom of the ocean and they're all the same size, which is weird. They all measure up to be 11 meters wide and one meter deep. The team at Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, 
our, our friends, they found about 15,000 of these and then they found 5,000 more that were even bigger. The little guys are micro depressions in the earth and the big ones are pockmarks. Initially, scientists here thought that it was methane underneath the seafloor coming out to say hi and you know, leaving a big crater, big poof. So rovers went down there, tests were done, no methane. In fact, there hasn't even been any methane for 50,000 years. So what's going on here? These craters are doing a pretty good job with the ecosystem though, wildly, because now there's deep sea creatures just living in them. They even found a whale skull just laying in one. Imagine being a crab, coming home to that, I throw up. I go, a little bubble of puke in the ocean. Number four, MV Derbyshire. This ship was twice the size of the Titanic, but James Cameron didn't make a movie about it, so you may not have heard about it. Let me fill you in. I'm not James Cameron, but I'll do my best. The MV Derbyshire was the biggest British registered merchant ship of all time to sink. That's an odd brag when you think about it. But she was assembled back in 1976 and lost in 1980 en route from Canada to Japan. A Mayday distress call was never issued and the ship was following proper ocean routes with weather routing companies, so they were doing all the right things, yet somehow it sank. September 15th, 1980, search began for the missing ship and crew, but six days later, the search was called off. Nothing was found, not even a clue, honestly. The ship was declared lost. The sister ship of the Derbyshire ended up sinking as well due to a deck cracking, so the families urged officials to search again. Come 1994, the Derbyshire was found. Number three, a huge squid. I'll talk about this thing every chance I get. I hope you haven't seen or heard about this because I slept a lot better the less I knew, honestly. The big fin squid, the BFS, the big squid, is rarely seen, hence why it's on our list here today. It actually lurks in many oceans, hiding in the deep. The big fin squid lives in the permanent dark zones of the ocean, around 1,200 meters or 4,000 feet deep in the sea. So the guy can't see anything. He's blind down there, as are most of these monsters. On November 11th, 2007, an ROV was searching around the deepest, darkest waters in the Gulf of Mexico, and lucky for us, they got one on film. Yeah, 23 feet long. I know you're probably wondering as soon as you saw that video. Depth perception is like, oh, maybe it's small, maybe it's this. Nope, stupidly large. They look like balloons, scary, haunting balloons, just casually floating, watching you. I hate how calm it looks too. It looks like it locked onto you, like it's like kinda following your moves. Is this a boss battle? This feels like a boss battle. Let's move on, this guy's scary. Number two, Siphonophore. Siphonophores, okay, where do I even begin? This is a real thing, not an alien? Okay, cool. Upon first glance, this appears to be a single multicellular organism, but they're actually an entire colony of polyps and medusoids that are collectively known as a zooid. Yep, I'm saying real words, I'm not just making them up. A few years ago, scientists found the longest siphonophore ever. They found it and it was 154 feet long. If you thought that last creature was long, this thing is stupid. Just a huge long piece of spaghetti just floating around in the ocean. But really, it's, it's actually not spaghetti. It's a bunch of different little creatures all working together. Reading up about this thing, there was a quote that I read and it said, we at least need to know what's down there. No, we don't. Leave it alone. Leave everything, this, leave it alone down there. I can't even deal with a spider in the apartment. Where do I even begin with this? And finally, number one, an ancient city. We'll end this list with a recent, recent discovery. The lost Egyptian city of Heraklion was found after disappearing under the Mediterranean Sea 1200 years ago. Now this city has a bit of history behind it, you know, being founded in the 8th century BC and all, and researchers believe Heraklion was the port that you'd arrive in if you were to travel back then. Well recently, last summer in 2021, more to this ancient sunken city was found in Egypt, and it's changing history, dare I say. This was led by the European Institute for Underwater Archaeology, this sunken military vessel, this 25 meter ship was found in this sunken ancient city. In another part of this lost city, remains of a Greek funerary area was also discovered, dating back to around the 4th century BC. So this discovery connects the historical dots for us. Greek merchants living in the ancient Egyptian city. This tells us that the Greeks settled here during the late Pharaoh dynasties, which is wild. We're literally just connecting all these pieces of this historical puzzle. And also we're finding treasure at the same time, so it's not all scary fish. We just need to send cameras and submarines underwater every and just check under every shell. Kicking off the list at number 10, SS Garisopa. We'll kick off this deep sea part three with a shipwreck. Whenever it comes to underwater stuff, I think I have thalassophobia. These were hard to look at and look into, rather. I got chills looking at these photos, honestly. The SS Garisopa was once a thriving British cargo ship. Back in 1941, during World War II, the cargo ship was en route, returning from India, carrying a pretty nice amount of silver. It was a lot of silver, an, an alarming amount of silver. A storm rolled in, so the captain made a quick decision 
knowing what was on board to avoid the rough waters as much as possible. So the ship changed direction and started heading towards Ireland. Again, this was 1941 during World War II, so not a great time to head that direction. The ship was spotted by a German plane and a U-boat later claimed the lives of the SS Garasopa's 85 passengers. News traveled quickly and once the war came to an end, a few divers checked out the area. There was nothing. Now fast forward to 2011, Odyssey Marines team found the ship. 14,000 feet below the surface, surrounded by just pure darkness. The team kept around 80% of the treasure found, and the rest went to Her Majesty's Treasury. In case you were wondering, there was around $150 million worth of treasure found. Yeah, if you can do it, then go, grab it, sure. It's like one of those things where someone's like, hey, you want $150 million, go into this deep, dark, scary thing. Would you do it? No, my answer is no. Number nine. Magnificent alien. How don't I talk about this little guy? Here we go. While the rest of the world was in panic mode, a new sea sponge was discovered in 2020. Named Advina Magnifica, which translates to magnificent alien. Literally, this thing's a little, little, little alien by himself. This sponge literally gets its name because it looks like E.T. And to be fair, yeah, it looks like E.T. Little phone home looking an ROV found this sample over 6,000 feet deep in the Pacific Ocean. They found it in what they called a forest of weird. That's just what you want to hear. Hey, how's the ocean? Oh, it's weird. Great, I'm not gonna ask anymore. Just alien sponges sticking their ET heads out hoping for some passing food. That's what the ocean is. Christiana Costello Bronco, the researcher who found this deep sea squishy, explains the discovery in an NOAA interview saying, as all of these organisms are intricately connected by documenting and describing marine biodiversity, we are building a better understanding of life and the impact of humans on earth. And in this case, in the ocean, end quote. This little guy is the key to humanity's survival. I feel it. You can see it in his eyes, really. He's confident. Number eight, underneath Thwaites Glacier. We've seen some fascinating stuff here on Most Amazing Top 10, specifically underwater footage. We can't get enough of it. We love exploring the deep, as do you, hence why you're here. Hi, welcome back. Thank you. Hit that thumbs up. This next one, I honestly couldn't believe. It's actual footage from the bottom of an Antarctic glacier. This glacier, though, is the size of Florida. So if it collapses, our sea levels could rise 10 feet. So yeah, let's drill a hole through the middle and see what's up. We'll send a camera down, no problem. In 2019, researchers did just that. They drilled 2,300 feet through the Thwaites Glacier, dropped a robot with a camera down it, and saw this. Now this is the first time we've ever seen the grounding zone of Thwaites Glacier. Lead scientist Brittany Schmidt says this project is a dream come true. Yeah, no doubt. This is beautiful. She describes it as her walking on the moon moment. There's only a meter of space between the bottom of the glacier and the rocky seafloor. Would you swim underneath it? Be honest. I would. No, I wouldn't. I would do this and come back really quick. Number seven, the rare whalefish. Located in California's Monterey Bay, scientists were able to get a close look at a fish with no eyes. So he probably didn't know he was being filmed. That's just unfair if you ask me. This little guy over here relies on his other senses to hunt and pick up on its surroundings. This footage was from over 6,000 feet deep, so the lack of light just decided the whalefish doesn't need eyes anymore in evolution. Isn't that great what evolution's like? You know what? You don't need eyes. It's pretty dark. You're good. Give me them, jeepers creepers, give me your eyes. It's great to get footage of them because whale fish are rarely recorded in the deep, let alone recorded alive. This guy is alive and well, look at him go. Not too fast, not too slow, just, he's on his own pace, he's doing his own thing. Number six, not treasure. We kicked this list off with some deep sea treasure, that's always fun, you know, until it gets reclaimed and your years worth of exploring goes to waste. But many deep sea ROV trips are not ideal, they're not fun. We don't always find a mammoth tusk or a glow in the dark shark. Sometimes we find barrels of waste. This dump site here was discovered off the coast of LA, 3,000 feet deep. These ROVs found around 27,000 barrels of waste. Yeah, you thought I was gonna say 27. That's pretty bad. Add thousands. The 2021 discovery was deemed staggering. Yep, I'd say so. You can literally see in these photos this aura of toxic waste like emitting from it. I don't see any ET sponges here. This is a graveyard. This is no good. ET wants nothing to do with this. Number five. Hydro Medusae. Sounds like a spell. Sounds like a Harry Potter spell. Another crazy deep sea alien fish. Here we go, let's do it. I'm never swimming again after this list. During a robotic exploration of the Marianas Trench in 2016, which is a pretty good place to get some deep sea fishies, researchers found a new unidentified species of jellyfish. How fun is that? We mentioned the immortal jellyfish on here before. That's always a good time. The jellyfish that Benjamin buttons it. He ages backwards, that's cool. This is another crazy one, just a lot deeper. At first, it had its tentacles spread out as if it was ready to, you know, catch some prey or some human or some ship. I don't know, it's ready for something. The tentacles act as a net catch prey, which is interesting. A fish that fishes with a net. How lovely is that? Also super alien. He was found near the Enigma Seamount at a depth of 3,700 meters. Hadromedusae jellyfish has a translucent bell, which is the most intriguing part when you look at it. And, oh, also its insides are glowing red and yellow. So yeah, did I mention alien possibly? Because maybe. Number four, deep sea hermit crab. The deep sea hermit crab. Do I have to talk about it? 
I guess I have to talk about it. Instead of carrying around empty gastropod shells like a hermit crab normally does, the hermit crab we imagine when hearing their name, these deep sea hermit crabs carry around sea anemones with them. Yeah, they just walk on stilts. Look at these dudes. I'm sorry, deep sea crabs on stilts? I'm all set. This almost was number one. This is almost worse than a spider. Let's pray he stays in the deepest depths of the Atlantic. Number three, deep sea pigs. It's not what you think, don't worry. It's not horrible. These guys are a genus of sea cucumber, but they have these little tube-like legs and they look really cute, which is why I have to include them. Cute, also a little bit weird. These ones look weirder than normal sea cucumbers, which is an odd statement to make, but I'll stand by it. They like to live on the seafloor where they move through the sediment searching for their next meal, and they eat by extracting tiny little particles of organic matter that have fallen from the surface of the ocean. So they're just there, just waiting for scraps, just looking around. How sad is that? So hungry. Sea pigs measure around four to six inches long. So yeah, they're, they're pretty cute. They're tiny guys. I'll admit it, they're cute. And they live at a depth of somewhere between 1,200 to 5,000 meters deep. So don't worry about any of these little piggies touching any of your little piggies when next time you take a dip because they're quite deep. Small but mighty, their skin carries a natural poison, which would make them a horrible midnight snack, as squishy as they look. When brought up closer to the surface, they literally disintegrate. So don't try it if you see one. It's like the video of the raccoon where he tries to wash uh, cotton candy he puts it in and disappears. He's like... Number two, the deepest plastic. We're almost done here, so we'll do a sad one for a second last spot here. Why not? Back in 2019, Victor Viscabo took a dive into the Challenger Deep, which is the deepest part of the Marianas Trench, and he found absolutely the scariest thing to ever see in the ocean. A plastic bag. Yeah, you don't want any of this in the ocean, for sure. Some guy brought some spaghetti home for the family, tossed the bag out, now it's all the way down here, and he has no idea. Awesome. I will say Victor broke the record for deepest dive, which of course is amazing for, you know, science, research, and advancements, and all that jazz, of course. But I feel like the more we discover and the deeper we go, the more we realize that we're inevitably doomed. And finally, number one, the deep sea anglerfish. So scary. Here we go. Let's end off on a scary note. Even scarier than pollution. It's not close. The deep sea anglerfish is just a sample of how terrifying the ocean can really be. We have no idea. It's also the most fascinating fish I've ever seen in my life. Living at depths of over 6,000 feet, the anglerfish lives in complete darkness. It was first discovered back in 1833 when it washed ashore somehow in Greenland, and then it was studied in Denmark. It was first referred to as the football fish or the mangobler. Mangobler is honestly more of a, yeah, I, I could definitely see that. The sea devils have quite the smile, but they don't often get a chance to show it, you know, being that deep and all and in the darkness. Finding prey that deep below the surface is quite the task. The ocean life is also quite sparse when it comes to meals of your choosing. Like I said, some of these guys have to just rely on just particles falling into their mouths. This is why it's often referred to as the fish that fishes. And it's all thanks to that little disco ball of death right here on the forehead. Female anglerfish have a glowing lure on the top of their head and it's awesome, it's beautiful. This light is created due to bioluminescent bacteria. Thousands of fish have it and the deep sea anglerfish uses it to hunt. It draws fish in right in front of its massive mouth and then they see the light and then moments later, bam, they see another light, the light of the fish gods. RIP, rest in Pacific. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have Mont Blanc and Imo. Halifax is a port city that is located here in Canada in the province of Nova Scotia. Halifax was a super important place during the First World War as it acted as a hot spot for ships that were carrying supplies, troops, ammunition, you know, war stuff. On December 6th, 1917, a Norwegian ship called Imo left Halifax and it ended up colliding with a French ship called the Mont Blanc. This is already disastrous, but it was made significant significantly worse by the fact that the Mont Blanc held explosives. Because of the collision, the Mont Blanc was pushed towards the shore and ended up setting the harbor front ablaze. Just a few minutes later, the entire ship exploded with a blast so strong that windows 50 miles away were shattered. Unfortunately, there were many, many people at the waterfront when the explosion happened, which led to 1,800 people dying in this accident. 9,000 people were injured, and it is said that 1,600 homes were destroyed in the blast. The force of this blast really cannot be understated. It was so powerful that it caused a tidal wave and violent tremors, which were able to uproot trees from out of the ground. They damaged railroad tracks, and they destroyed numerous buildings whose debris was scattered for hundreds of yards. In the end, this is what made this explosion one of the most violent non-nuclear explosions in history, and what makes it likely the world's largest accidental man-made explosion. In our number nine spot today, we have this marine chorus. Okay, so out of context, if if I played you this sound, what would you think it is? Uh -huh. 
Definitely not something underwater, right? Well, as it turns out, this sound was indeed captured under the water, and these are the sounds of fish calls. While I always expected the chorus of marine animals to sound a little more similar to the stylings of Sebastian the crab, apparently that isn't even close. Okay, I'm not gonna lie, I didn't even know that most fish had calls, but it turns out that our human ears just can't perceive all of the hoots, moans, barks, and chirps that take place in the vast seas. This recording actually helped scientists realize that there are fish who sing together in a chorus every day at dusk and dawn. There have now been around 800 species of fish that have been identified and confirmed to make some form of noise, and apparently some fish even engage in shouting matches in noisier parts of the ocean, which is kind of hilarious to imagine. I guess on the list of creepy noises, this one is less creepy and more just informative? In our number 8 spot today we have the whistle. This is a sound that was first recorded in 1997 by the NOAA and was the source of many mysteries for years while people speculated about what may have caused the sound. While it still isn't exactly clear, it is now believed that the sound may have come from an underwater volcano eruption. If you didn't know, underwater or submarine volcanoes are located in all oceans on our earth and they're extremely interesting. There are certain kinds of marine animals that only exist near these extreme environments. Many submarine volcanoes are located near the areas of tectonic plate formations, which are also known as mid-ocean ridges. There is a YouTube user called Some Canadian, and they left a comment on a video of this whistle sound that pretty much sums it up exactly. First, we'll listen to the sound played at 10 times the original speed. The comment read, quote, It could be the sound of something moving through tunnels. One, volcanic eruptions and gases. Two, something big and hungry. You choose. I think they might really be onto something there. In our number seven spot today, we have Bloop. Why are all of the weirdest ocean sounds first recorded in 1997? Bloop is another one that came from that year, and it was a loud and unusual sound that was placed as occurring several times off the southern coast of South America, and it was so loud that it could be heard over 5,000 kilometers away. At first, researchers were confused because while the sound was actually similar to known sounds of living creatures, it was just way too loud that not even the blue whale, the largest living creature, could have produced it. So what is it then? Well, as it turns out, it is in fact not the kraken, and instead it is actually consistent with ice quakes that are generated by large icebergs as they crack and fracture. It seems like this sound going with that explanation doesn't really make sense, but hey, I'm no scientist. But here's the sound for you to to judge for yourself. In our number 6 spot today, we have the Western Pacific Bio Twang. In 2014, researchers and scientists heard weird sounds coming from the Mariana Trench, which, for the record, seems like the worst place for there to be strange noises coming from. For years, experts couldn't pin down this sound, and it was dubbed the Western Pacific Bio Twang, and while there is now a theory that was proposed by researchers from Oregon State University, they have also said that they might be entirely wrong. First, for reference, here's a little clip of the sound I'm talking about. Okay, so if you're like me, my mind immediately went to something alien related or some sort of creature that perhaps we haven't yet discovered. I mean, this is the Mariana Trench we're talking about. The theory put forward by the Oregon State researchers was that perhaps this may be a new type of baleen whale call. Okay, that's probably the best of all of the options, but I really don't like when someone tells me the answer to a scientific mystery only to tell me that that might not actually be the answer at all. While the low part of the sound would make sense to attribute to the baleen whale, it's the end high-pitched twangy part that would be incredibly unique. The wide range of frequencies in the sound are what continues to baffle those who are trying to find the source of this mysterious sound. In our number 5 spot today we have Julia. Julia is a sound that was recorded in 1999 by the US National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, which I've already talked about today. It sounds like it could be straight out of a horror movie, so considering it was a sound that came from our ocean, and at first no one could tell where it had come from, it it really was quite frightening. The sound has now likely been demystified as researchers are pretty positive they know the origin of it. It is now believed that this sound was caused by an iceberg running aground off Antarctica. The sound, however, was insanely loud. It was so loud that it could be heard over the entire Equatorial Pacific Ocean Autonomous Hydrophone Array. Researchers were later able to narrow down what they believe may have been the point where the sound originated, although they've never actually been able to pinpoint it exactly. 
Most of the time when people hear the Julia sound, they hear it sped up at 16 times the original speed, but today we are going to listen to a clip of the sound at regular speed because I think it is much more eerie this way. In our number four spot today, we have Knock. Okay, this is one that I'll admit was not captured by a submarine, but it was still underwater and it truly is terrifying. A few years ago, a beluga whale named Nock, who was unfortunately in captivity, was recorded as he swam below the water. Beluga whales have been called the canaries of the sea, and for good reason, but Nock really wanted to up the ante and instead blessed us all with this sound. <laughs> Nock had this uncanny ability to mimic the rhythm and tone of human voices, and it truly is kind of frightening. It of course is also a little sad, as part of this was probably because he spent most of his life being forced to listen to humans speak because he was being held in captivity. Before this recording of Nock, the voices of belugas and their sometimes human-like sounds have been talked about, but Nock was the first time it was recorded, and honestly, I kind of wish it hadn't been. In our number three spot today, we have the bioduck. Since the 1960s, this sound has absolutely stumped researchers who heard it. This sound was basically what the name attributed to it would suggest. It sounded like some sort of mechanical duck. For decades, researchers would hear this sound and it would often be heard and recorded again in the spring and winters. After all of these years though, it seems as though the answers to this mysterious sound are finally coming to light. In 2013, researchers attached sensors that collect acoustic data to two whales. One of those tags recorded for 18 hours and the other for eight, and the whales they were attached to were traveling with other whales in groups of five to 40, and they were all eating basically the entire time. Throughout this time, with the tags on the whales, there were a total of 32 calls heard, and this data is what led researchers to finally understand where the bioduck sound was coming from. As it turns out, this mysterious sound was actually the call of the mink whale. Researchers still aren't exactly clear as to what the call means to the whales, but it was a fantastic discovery that finally closed an almost 50 year old scientific mystery. In our number two spot today, we have Upsweep. We all know how little we know about the ocean, and that also includes what kind of creatures lie in it. So while this mysterious sound, out of context probably wouldn't be that freaky, when put into this situation it becomes quite a bit more eerie. This sound is referred to as upsweep and it was caught when the Pacific Marine Environmental Laboratory started its sound surveillance system in August of 1991. The sound is apparently more seasonal with its peaks in spring and fall, but it is unclear if the changing of seasons is responsible for this sound or if it's coming from something that lurks in the ocean and remains undiscovered. Just for reference, here's a clip of that sound played at 20 times the original speed. It is possible that this sound could be coming from underwater volcanic activity, but it is also possible that it's not, so who really knows? In our number one spot today, we have an earthquake. Okay, so to add another creepy Mariana Trench sound to this list, we have one that was taken from the bottom of the Challenger Deep. In fact, it was the first ever sound recording to be taken from the bottom of the Challenger Deep, so it's a pretty cool scientific advancement, as well as a terrifying sound. Despite the crushing pressures and the fact that there's no sunlight, the Challenger Deep is actually pretty pretty noisy, and that is because of the fact that sound travels a really long way underwater, which ends up kind of turning the Challenger deep into a sort of echo chamber of oceanic sounds. So while the recording was able to pick up things like the sound of a boat almost 11 kilometers overhead and the sounds of whale calls, they were also able to pick up the sound of a magnitude 5 earthquake rumbling near Guam on July 16th, 2015. lie. While being one of the scariest things I've ever heard, this is also one of the coolest things I've ever heard in my life too. Science really is just so cool sometimes. Kicking off our list at number 10, a mammoth tusk. 
Scientists are currently trying to bring the woolly mammoth back to life, so it's fitting that we throw this recent discovery on our list here. Back in 2019, scientists from Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, they were poking around the ocean floor. They were poking around 10,000 feet, not too far off the coast of California, and they found what they thought was an elephant tusk. Now that by itself would be a pretty neat discovery. Animal remains in the deep sea, let's go, that's great. No, this one was even better. We found a mammoth tusk. At first, the team only grabbed a small sample, but last year, in July, they were able to return and get the entire thing. Voila! It belonged to a Colombian mammoth. Those were mammoths that didn't have a lot of hair. They didn't need it. They lived in North America, so things got a little warm sometimes. 10,000 years after they died off, we're still finding their tusks. What do you think about bringing them back to life? Should we do that? Sound off below. I, I say no. Definitely not. They're way too big and scary. Also, they died before. They'll probably die again. Sorry, I don't know. In our number nine spot today, we have the Baltic Sea Anomaly. In 2011, while searching for treasure in the Baltic Sea, these divers came across something super weird. It was a 70 meter long object laying 300 feet below the sea, and to this day, no one knows for sure what it is. It's a massive disc-shaped metal object, and while it certainly is weird to find a huge underwater structure that no one can identify, the weirdest part about this story is that those who found it claimed that their equipment stopped working only when they were around this massive unknown structure. There was some sort of electrical interference, but only when they got close or directly above it. Some people believe it's either a glacial deposit, which is the result of thawing glaciers, or an alien spacecraft. I'll let you guys decide on this one. UFO or glacial deposit? I'm gonna go with UFO because that is way more exciting. In our number eight spot today, we have a USO. Daryl Miklos is an explorer who took a deep dive following maps that had been put together by his friend and former astronaut Gordon Cooper. The map Daryl was using was initially made to help identify more than 100 magnetic anomalies in the sea. During one dive at a location within the Bermuda Triangle, he thought he was going to find an ancient shipwreck, but instead found something that continues to stump researchers and Daryl himself. He came across a very strange structure that wasn't like anything he had ever seen before. This structure had long obtrusions which stuck out from its sides, and the whole thing was covered in corals, so whatever this thing is, it has been down there for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Daryl has said, quote, there's identical formations in three different areas and they don't look nature made. They don't look man made. Certainly nothing I've ever seen based on my experience and I have years of experience at doing this. We've identified multiple different types of shipwreck material. This doesn't match or look anything like that. End quote. People have started speculating that this structure may just be the remains of a crashed UFO. If it isn't, then what else could it be? I'm feeling open to suggestions, so let me know. In our number seven spot today, we have a giant squid attack. While diving into the deep sea in a submarine, there's quite a few things that could go wrong. Some are certainly scarier than others, but I'm gonna go ahead and say that being attacked by a giant squid is somewhere on the list of bad ones. Maybe not life-threatening since you're in a submarine, but still absolutely terrifying. That is what happened to a pair of Greenpeace submariners while on an expedition in 2004 in the Bering Sea between Russia and Alaska. The squid sprays ink and is clearly quite stressed out, which I'll admit is actually kind of sad to see. It isn't quite clear exactly why the squid was in this area, as it is quite far north for its usual habitat, but it was there nonetheless. Researchers aren't exactly sure what kind of squid it was for sure, but all they know is that it was very, very large. I think it's safe to say that those people were glad that they were in a submarine that day. In our number six spot today, we have the massive siphonophore. Okay. I'm not saying that this is going to be scary to everyone, but I'm not gonna lie. Knowing that things like this exist in the deep sea is absolutely terrifying to me. So there are these things called siphonophores that exist in the ocean, and they appear to be a singular multicellular organism, but they're actually an entire colony of polyps and medusoids that are collectively known as a zooid. So a few years ago, scientists found the longest siphonophore they've ever found, and it was a whopping 154 feet long. Yep, just a huge long piece of a bunch of different little creatures all working together. I don't know why it freaks me out so much. Maybe it's because it's a bunch of creatures that all seem as though they share a brain. Maybe it's something I just can't comprehend. Or maybe it's because this thing is 154 feet long. Regardless of whatever it is, the deep sea is just as fascinating as it is 
terrifying. In our number 5 spot today we have dying coral reefs. In 2009, after a 4 week expedition to explore the deep ocean just southwest of Tasmania, while there were many exciting discoveries, there was also one that was much more grim. The scientists found deep water coral reefs, but in the same moment as the excitement came the realization that these coral reefs are dying. There needed to be much more research into exactly what was causing the reef systems to die, but the worry was that whatever the cause was would extend into the shallower reefs as well, which would cause massive problems for both marine life as well as human life. Scientists needed to figure out whether the coral was dying because of ocean warming, disease, or increasing ocean acidity. Whatever the cause, if it were to extend into the shallower coral reefs and cause those to die off as well, 25% of marine life would lose their habitat, the coastal fishing industry would collapse, coastal tourism economies would shrink, coastlines would erode, we wouldn't have the same access to submarine animals which have helped us with medical breakthroughs, and honestly the list just continues on. So while this one might not currently seem like a scary addition to this list, it could have many more implications than we are even aware of. In our number 4 spot today we have this deep sea feast. As it turns out, deep sea feasts are quite a horrific sight as this video footage from a deep dive expedition will show you. This is the scene that scientists were welcome to on a deep diving expedition that took place in 2019. What you are seeing is dozens of octopuses mercilessly devouring the 4 to 5 meter long remains of what is believed to have been a baleen whale. Their meal includes some of the internal organs, while large scavengers are stripping away the flesh and those good old zombie worms are diving into their favorite meal, the lipids and fat from the bones. While this is a grisly sight, I guess it's nice to know that nothing goes to waste in the deep sea. In an environment where food is scarce, this must have been a pretty big win for all of these creatures. Still, seeing video footage of it is pretty wild. In our number 3 spot today we have the long arm squid. The long arm squid is not often seen and thank goodness for that because they are so unbelievably freaky. They can be found in many different oceans but they live in the permanently dark zone of the ocean around 1219 meters or 4000 feet deep in the sea. On November 11th 2007 as an ROV was searching around the deep waters in the Gulf of Mexico, it was able to catch one of these guys on film. While there is still a ton that remains a mystery about these elusive creatures, it is believed that they can grow to be around 23 feet long or over 7 meters. The real creepy stance that these guys have is when they hold out their extremely long appendages perpendicular to their body which creates a sort of elbow look. I don't know, just freaks me out. Imagine waking up and having a giant squid with elbows floating around your room. I know that won't happen, but I'm just saying, imagine. In our number 2 spot today we have a squid graveyard. During a 2012 expedition into the Gulf of California on the sea floor, scientists came across a ton of squid carcasses and squid egg sheets, which was a bit of a scary sight, but they made a note of it, captured their footage, and just continued on. In 2015 when they returned to the same area they found even more, and now they really had to ask themselves, why was this happening? Well, they then took a look at the squid's life and things started to make a little bit more sense, although it is still unclear. So many species of squid will see the adults all join in large groups to spawn and lay clusters of eggs on the sea floor. Shortly after this, many of the adults pass away. This isn't the case for all squid however. There are some mothers who instead lay their eggs in an egg sheet which they keep between their arms for months. When the babies finally hatch, the mother will then drift her way down to the sea floor. So this answers the questions why the squid died, but it doesn't answer the question of why there were so many bodies in one specific zone, and the answer to that still remains a mystery. This is however an important part of the underwater ecosystem as these squid carcasses then become food for the other animals that live in the area such as crabs, sea stars, ratfish, and other crustaceans and bottom dwelling scavengers. In our number one spot today we have the guardians of the underworld. I'm here asking you why there are so many insanely large creatures in the deep sea. I know, deep sea gigantism, but still. Why? So here we are talking about another insanely large creature, this time it's a jellyfish which has been nicknamed the guardian of the underworld. This creature can reach 10 meters or 33 feet in length and despite its enormous size, it isn't usually caught on camera. Thanks to the Mbari's ROV however, more video footage was able to be captured of this amazing and terrifying jelly. In the 27 years that the Mbari's ROV has been patrolling the deep sea, they've only observed this animal 7 times 
So it really does feel kind of special that we get a chance to take a peek at this thing in its natural habitat. While those long billowy things coming off of it appear as though they would be stinging tentacles, they're actually more like arms that help with feeding. It is thought that they use these massive arms to envelop their unsuspecting prey and that was all I needed to hear to swear off the ocean forever. The red colouring of these jellies helps them blend into the dark backdrop of the sea making them a perfect predator. A member of the Embari team said, quote, it's one of the largest invertebrate predators known in the ocean, yet little is understood about its ecology and behavior, end quote. Mm -hmm.